بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praise belongs to Allah and may the peace and blessings of Allah Jalla wa ala be upon his final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh My dear brothers and sisters and viewers at home and welcome to a new episode of Islamica where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the opportunity to share benefit and increase our knowledge in a way that you have the opportunity of calling us and posting or giving us your question and I will try my very best inshallah ta'ala to answer that if you uh, don't have access to a direct phone number here in the uh, studio here or you have another way of putting the question to us you have the whatsapp version or the whatsapp way of putting the question to us and both of those numbers are appearing at the bottom of your screen so just as we always do inshallah ta'ala we uh, start in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending salutations upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and as we are waiting for your calls as we are waiting for your questions uh, to come through uh, on the WhatsApp I just wanted to uh, mention uh, a beautiful hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where the meaning is that none of you will truly believe until I become more beloved to them than their parents than their children and all of mankind this is an authentic hadith mentioned in the books of Sahih so this particular hadith the Prophet alayhi sallallahu alayhi wasallam uh, said that our Iman will not be complete our Iman will not be complete until we love the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam more than our parents and we know the standing of our parents in our lives in fact Allah Taala has commanded us immediately after commanding us to worship him Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone then to be good to our parents that your that Allah Jalla wa'ala has decreed that you worship him alone and that you are good to your parents so we know the status of parents in Islam however subhanallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, mentioned that the status of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is of a standing in our lives that we should love him more than anybody now what does that actually mean loving him more than anybody subhanallah meaning that whatever the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam chose to do from his, his life which is part of the sunnah we will prefer that over our own choices we will fulfill his commandments and stay away from his prohibitions and this is our uh, showing that we love the Prophet وسلم, more than what our own selves may desire or may what we uh, want from ourselves so this is one part and maybe the next question is how do we de then develop a love and how do we increase our love for the Prophet Muhammad that would be if you like simply to study his life and when studying the life of the Prophet Muhammad you are studying the story of Al-Islam from the beginning time when the Prophet ﷺ was born subhanallah up until he received the revelation at the age of 40 and then after that the 23 or so years uh, period where he ﷺ was receiving revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and likewise that the Prophet ﷺ was dealing with so many different incidents and circumstances and uh, and things that he والسلام, showed us guidance in that and demonstrating and fulfilling that we as we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that he was a mercy to mankind we did not send you except as a mercy to mankind so studying the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is uh, a great and amazing uh, way of increasing our love for the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and this is uh, just the, the first point I wanted to mention at the beginning of the show. Uh, we have uh, one caller on the line, inshallah ta'ala. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam, Sheikh. Yes, brother. Got one question. Yes. In yes, Salah, when you um, bow down for Ruku, yeah. what happens if your back isn't straight, isn't horizontal to the ground? Should you maybe do exercise or lose, try to lose weight to, mm. to perfect the, right. the bowing? Sure, good question, mashallah. Okay. 
طيب uh, we have another call on the line السلام عليكم وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته شيخ yes brother um, شيخ I want to uh, just ask you something regarding um, the Quran and Karim and uh, it's just not particularly targeting you as a shape much like here to answer our question much on your show I'm assuming next to you is the Quran uh, actually it's Sahih al-Bukhari it's Sahih al-Bukhari <laughs> okay yeah. okay so this is what I wanted to understand what book is there and if it is a Quran yeah. should it be there as a prop yeah yeah no it's it's Hadith book actually Okay. Okay. Just like I said, to clarify that, Sheikh. Okay, brother. Barakallah. May Allah give us the ability to read and understand the Quran. Amen. Barakallah. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Barakallah. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I think we answered the question from the the, the brothers, uh, the second call. But uh, maybe just to add on to that, that yes, um, uh, the Quran is is it permitted to use as as a prop? Um, no doubt us respecting uh, the Qur'an is, is manifested and shown in, in different ways. And that is the objective, to respect the Qur'an. To love the Qur'an means to read it, to act on it, uh, and to ponder over it, to memorize it, to read it. So many, this all, if you like, comes under the umbrella of, of loving and respecting the Qur'an. And anything that would, if you like, um, be contrary to that or go against that, to disrespect the Qur'an, and maybe the question is, okay, using the Qur'an as a prop, where, you know, we put, you know, in, in a studio, we use like plants, or we use other things as, as props, um, which you might say, well, are we using the Qur'an in such a, a demeaning, uh, if you like, fashion? I guess if you look at it, um, is this how people would, is this, obviously it's not the intention, it's not intended, and I don't think necessarily even comes across as that we're just simply using it as a prop. It's a reminder to the people that maybe what is, is being spoken about, even when I've seen sometimes lectures, when a person's giving a lecture that they hold the, the, the mushaf in their hand and they remind their people. I mean, if all intents and purposes, I'm using this as a prop as well, but it is a reminder to the people as well. So I guess it really depends how it uh, appears in front of the screen or how it's utilized. But no doubt it's a... A subtle point, it's a good point to mention and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be from those people who love and respect the Qur'an and fulfill its commands, Allahumma ameen. Uh, the next question, or rather well, the question before that actually, was concerning ruku, uh, the bowing position while in salah and uh, while we are uh, in, in, in ruku or in sujood, that there is a, a particular way that we will perform that action. So while we are in sujood, there are seven parts of our body that are on the floor. Okay, we make sure that our elbows are not touching the floor. We raise them up. Okay, similarly, when we are standing up, we stand up uh, straight with our hands, you know, right over the left. And similarly, uh, uh, when we bow, we put our hands on our knees. We don't have them, you know, hanging by the side. There is a particular manner and a way that we will perform the rukur. Now, as we know that the Prophet, ﷺ, when he performed his rukur, it was to the extent that if you, as described, if you used to place something on his back, that it wouldn't fall off. So the rukur position is, if you like, you can say something like a 90 degrees with your legs here and your body like that, but not everybody can do that due to age, due to their physical uh, makeup, if you like. But what goes back to each individual is that you are maximizing and doing what you are able to do to to bow correctly. So if this is the optimum position, you would call it a 90 degree position or something close to that, then inshallah you fulfill the rukur. It's not as though the person has just literally just bowed over just a few degrees and then going back, then we'd say that that's not sufficient. There is a deficiency in you performing your rukur. Now, if you have a back problem or you are maybe old in age or you have um, other, you know, other circumstances or which doesn't allow you to go all the way, all the way down into you know, that, that position, but you're doing the best that you can, then of course that is sufficient for you. We're not going to say you repeat your prayers, invalid. But like every other aspect of the prayer, we will make sure that inshallah ta'ala, we do it to the best of our ability. Okay? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is best. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless the brother for, for the question.
Okay, we have uh, some of the WhatsApp questions that have come through. Alhamdulillah, there's quite a few that have come through. Um, طيب. So my friend is doubting Islam because he is afraid what his family will say now that he has become Muslim. He doesn't want to. He doesn't want this stress and is now found finding doubts in the validity of the Quran. What advice can I share with him? So what I would say is that um, we need to separate issues first and foremost, and that pressures and stress that one may have from uh, their family members doesn't have anything directly to do with the validity of Islam. Okay, if at one point in time you went on a journey and you saw that Islam was the haq, it was the truth, that you were convinced by the message uh, in the Quran, the teachings of Islam, uh, the fact that you know you, you may have family members or peers or friends or that may question, that doesn't have any link to the validity and the authenticity of Islam. Okay, um, so what I would say is to separate those issues and if you have any uh, you know, if you are facing some stress and some questions from your family, why, 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 why? Well, as a new Muslim, you're not expected to know everything. Um, you're not expected to know the answers for everything. And the fact that you don't know the answers for everything doesn't mean that what you believe in is somehow um, any less authentic. Okay, it just means that I, I don't have all the knowledge in the world, which means I need to increase my knowledge. And Alhamdulillah, in Islam, if I don't know the answer to something, I, feel, I have full right and capability of going to ask somebody uh, that particular question and they give me the answer for that. Ask the people of knowledge if you don't know. So there's no hiding away. So the fact you don't have any answers or don't have answers to certain questions, that's not a problem. Okay? Islam is something very simple, that the person is convinced with who their creator is and the right the creator has over them in them submitting to the Creator, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also and completely logical that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us that wouldn't just leave us and abandon us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us a message and throughout time sent us many messages actually and that we, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us and knows us best therefore has directed us this is the optimum, this is the very best way that you should live your life so therefore sent prophets and messengers to us and that I accept that and I accept the finality of prophethood with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's Islam, okay? Saying that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the messenger of Allah. That in a nutshell is Al-Islam. You accept that, alhamdulillah, you entered into the faith of Islam. And then after that, you build your knowledge, okay? So what I would say is that if people are raising issues about, oh, Islam, oh the Quran says, go and slaughter people, go kill people, do this and that and the other. There are... Of course, these arguments have been mentioned for hundreds of years. And it is not as though that the Muslims are trying to hide these verses away. They are very, very straightforward, simple answers to all of these uneducated claims against the Quran. Okay, so they are very, very simple answers to dispel any of these doubts that may come to you, inshallah ta'ala. So what I would say first and foremost is separate the issues. At times we do have stress with our family members. May Allah well make it easy for you. But that doesn't impact the validity of Islam. There may be some you know, trials and tribulations, but we with educated people, ask people about how to answer these questions, these issues, and inshallah ta'ala, uh, this will put your heart and mind at rest by even Allah ta'ala. Wallahu a'lam. The next question, what is the greatest sin according to the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Well, the Prophet alayhi wa sallam was asked, a'adhum uh, al-dhunub, or the greatest of sins, and is niddan wa huwa khalaqak. That is to set up a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knowing that Allah Jalla wa ala created you. So to set up a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the absolute essence and reason that we were created is to, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the hikmah or the, wisdom, the uh, wisdom and reason why we were created. To worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the verse in Surah al dhariyat وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Okay, so that is very clear. Allah didn't create jinn and mankind except to worship Him alone. So that being the absolute reason for us to uh, fulfill and the reason why we were created, the opposite of that would be, of course, uh, the worst sin that a person could commit. 
and that is to set up partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What do I mean by that? Whether you are that individual is setting up partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in worship, or setting up partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his lordship, or setting up partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his names and attributes that are specific and unique and belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone to give any of these attributes or traits to any of the creation. Okay? So this means that we make Allah Azza wa Jal unique. Okay, we make him unique and we, we single him out, subhanahu wa ta'ala, in his lordship, in his worship, and his names and attributes. And anyone who would make something, not even above, but something equal to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet ﷺ said that this would be from the greatest of sins. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Is it sunnah for the mu'adhin to repeat even after the imam, even if the imam voice is loud and clear to the congregation? Okay, so there are certain circumstances where there is a uh, salatul jama'ah, there's a congregational prayer, the imam is leading the prayer. And as we know, the one who's leading the prayer when he moves from one movement to the next, he will say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Sami Allahu Ali Min Hamida, and things like that, okay? And then everybody follows behind. Now, if you've ever been to Mecca and Medina, you will find that the Imam says the, the movements of the Salah, and then there's somebody who repeats it after. And it is, no doubt, it is much louder so that everybody can hear. So is it permitted for somebody from the congregation to then relay what the Imam has said? Yes, there's premise, there's precedent for this. Okay, yes, there is precedent for this. Um, there's not a problem in that, inshallah ta'ala. But the question is, even when the Imam's voice is loud and clear to the congregation. So if the voice of the Imam is absolutely clear to everybody, that there's no need to relay the sound, then we say, okay, then there is no need. So there wouldn't be any need for a person to repeat afterwards. Okay. Uh, and sometimes in, you know, masajid where the speakers are confined to one particular space, everybody could hear the imam very, very clearly. At other times, you may find that the, mashallah, there's so many people that have attended, people may be praying outside. And those people outside may not hear, may not hear what the imam says. So then somebody has chosen to relay that information. Okay. Uh, so it goes by, you know, uh, each situation is, is taken in its individual kind of um, its own its own merit and if, it, if it's required then it's not a problem if it's not required then it's not required but the thing is these decisions are made by people who are you know, the movers and the shakers the shakers and the masjid they're the decision makers I may see it a different way but if I I'm not a person who's making decisions it's not for me to say well you don't need to do this you don't need to yeah, you just, just leave the issue alhamdulillah okay they want to create fitna if people have made a decision to do that, they made a decision to do that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from everybody. Okay, inshallah, we've come to the end of this particular part of the show where we will continue after the break with Allah ta'ala answering your questions. Please stay with us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ba'ad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back, brothers and sisters. After listening to Adhan for Salat al Dhuhr. And just before the break, we were answering some of your WhatsApp questions. Alhamdulillah, you have the opportunity still to call us. And we have, of course, a caller on the line. But don't forget, you can send your WhatsApp questions to us as well. So we'll take the caller now. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamualaikum salam assalamu alaikum alaikum salam wa rahmatullah um brother i just want to know um if you get interest in your account how can i get rid of it okay thank you for your question okay that's all it thank you You're assalamu alaikum wa alaikum salam wa okay uh, so the sisters asked that if one has uh, like some bank account and that at times, uh, maybe monthly or quarterly or however often it is that the bank may then put interest into your, into your account. Um, what do I do with that? So knowing, uh, first and foremost, that this is to be considered interest, that I'm not allowed to benefit from that, what the bank gives to me. That's called interest, riba. So therefore, to keep my money pure, 
to keep my money pure. I make sure that that extra that's given to me, I dispose of it. Okay, I dispose of it. Depending on how much money you have in the account, it could vary from a few pence a month, or it could be a few pounds, maybe even more than that, depending on the funds that you have. Nonetheless, whatever it is, you are to dispose of it and not to benefit yourself. And I would also advise not to start giving any of your family members, because maybe that person gets interest and they start giving it to you. So you start sharing that what is considered a malun khabith. This is, if you like, an impure money. It's a filthy money. So therefore, you wouldn't want any of you or your family members to take anything from that. Um, so what you can do, and when you dispose of it, it's not even something that you are seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's reward for as a sadaqah. Because sadaqah, you give pure wealth, pure money, not filthy money like riba. So therefore, if you want to uh, discreetly, you want to discreetly, if you like, go to like a charity box or even online a charity and just give it and dispose of it that way, then you can do that, inshallah ta'ala, okay? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Uh, we have another call on the line. I hope the answer is clear, sister. May Allah bless you. Assalamu oh. alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Caller. Caller dropped. Tayyip. If you want to call back, inshallah ta'ala, feel free to, to call back. You'll get through straight away, inshallah ta'ala. So some of the uh, WhatsApp questions. Which is more spiritually beneficial? A hajj? or an Umrah in the last 10 days of Ramadan. So spiritual benefit, I mean, that's, that's really difficult to kind of put a measure upon. I mean, in terms of what I would uh, recommend uh, for you to fulfill Hajj or performing Umrah in Ramadan, bearing in mind that the reward of Umrah in Ramadan is equal to Hajj. What I would say is if you have the financial means to perform the Hajj, this is the pillar of Al-Islam. Performing Umrah in Ramadan is not from the pillars of Islam. Um, so therefore, I would uh, recommend you from a ada or from a, perform, a performing uh, and completion point of view, then for you to perform your Hajj, no question. And to be honest, when you go to perform your Hajj, it's likely that you will be able to perform an Umrah as well. Okay, if you're performing uh, Qiran or Hajj Tamattu, then you'll have your Umrah performed and then you make your Hajj. As for what is more spiritually beneficial for you, it may differ from one person to the next. Allahu Alam. Uh, may Allah Azrael give us success to increase our knowledge for this and to perform it in the way that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam commanded us. Ameen. Uh, call on the line. Assalamu Alaikum. Alaikum Assalam. Alhamdulillah. Barakatuh. Yes, brother. Sheikh, I've got this question. Yeah, it's very like uh, on my mind always. I don't know if it's what's what's like, it's a natural feeling, but I just have a fear that when I stand in front of Allah on the day of judgment, mm. am I end up going to the hellfire? Is that natural or is it what's what's like? I don't know. I have no idea. Could you please um, okay. clear about this for me, please? Okay. Thank you. Thank May Allah bless you, brother. Yeah. Uh, so the brother's question is was quite clear that uh, is this a form of waswasa, whispers from shaitan, that you have this overwhelming fear that on the Yawm Al-Qiyamah, when you stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that maybe you don't have enough and that your destination will be maybe hellfire. What I would say to you, brother, this is uh, certainly, I would say, certainly not waswasa. Uh, because this is something that every Muslim should feel that we have a fear for our own selves on Yawm Al-Qiyamah because there is no guarantee for any human being of their destination where they are going. No guarantee. No one says, I have a Dhaman guarantee to go to Jannah straight away. But something like this, if you like, is represents one half of of how we are going to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having fear, having fear that, yes, uh, my, my deeds may be rejected or fear that on Yawm al Qiyam I, might, I may not have enough good deeds. So for this to be something 
positive, meaning that fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something positive. And how is it positive? It will be positive, inshallah ta'ala, that it pushes you, it pushes you to do good deeds and not to be in a state of despair or that you have lost all hope because this is what we don't want. We want a fair balance of fear and hope. And if a person has too much fear, overwhelming fear that they lose hope, then this is when, if you like, the, the fear becomes uh, a harm to them because they have lost hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have lost hope in themselves of doing anything. So we need to, if you like, uh, direct and control this type of fear, if that's the correct wording, uh, and utilizing it, if you like, or yeah, utilizing it in, in the correct way. That having this fear is a positive, positive thing for us as Muslims. And how it becomes something positive for us is that it pushes us and that it gives us an energy and a desire to do more and have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that yes, Allah jalla wa'ala is shadeed al-iqab, the most, is the severest in punishment, but also is arham al-rahimeen, is the most merciful of anything that can be merciful. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is arham bik min ummik, is that Allah is, really is more merciful to you than your own mother. So having this fear, brother, may Allah is really increase us in this type of fear, which is a positive fear that allows us to work harder, that allows us to uh, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more sincerely in accordance and in line with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So brother, that is certainly not waswasa. And don't be uh, swayed by what shaitan may want to do to you. No doubt the shaitan will come to us in different ways. I want to harm us and for us to lose hope. Because yes, maybe the shaitan will push in yawm al-qiyamah, you've got no hope, you've got no chance, you're such a sinner, you're this and you're that. We ignore that. Know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yes, we have fear of Allah azza wa jal, but at the same time we have hope as well. And what, if you like, encompasses that is our love. Our love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in wanting to obey His commands, fulfill His commands, stay away from that what is prohibited. Fulfilling the pillars of Islam. Islam is not complicated. Islam, alhamdulillah, has made something very simple for us. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us tawfiq, give us success in this life and in the hereafter. And the yawm al-qiyamah, that we are min al-muflihin, that we are from those who are successful on yawm al-qiyamah, Allahumma ameen. A beautiful question, brother. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. Ameen. Uh, next question. Uh, can a woman request divorce from a man, well, I assume the man is her husband, so her husband, yes. So in Islam, um, the Prophet وسلم, said that any woman who asks her husband for divorce without, without, for absolutely no reason at all, absolutely no reason at all, then she will not um, smell the perfume of paradise. So we understand the opposite of that. If there, there is an absolute reason, there's an absolute reason that the sister is unable to live with her husband because of his uh, ill behavior towards her, because of oppression towards her, because of, there could be many reasons, but life has become unbearable because of the treatment of the other individual. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not burdened any soul beyond their capability. But what I would say is but before you jump to, in any situation, of course I'm addressing husband as well, there's a problem between him and his spouse, that the first solution is, خلاص, I divorce you and that's it. No, absolutely not. That there are many steps that are, should be taken before you reach uh, such an outcome or such a request of asking for divorce. And we do live in a day and age where people do jump uh, all the way to the end asking for divorce, asking for separation without, you know, really wanting to, to try and get through that difficult situation, which ultimately everybody will face. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, you know, if you fear that there is uh, problems between the spouses, then you send a judge from his, or they say a judge, like an advisor from his family, an advisor from her family, and you read the aslaha. If they want to reconcile, 
Okay, so we don't always jump to the end game, if you like, divorce, separation, breaking up of families, and so on. That there are steps that should be taken. And Allah Ta'ala mentions this in the Quran. But going back to the question, yeah, if she feels that it is absolutely unbearable, they've gone through all of these steps, there is no sulh, there is no reconciliation, we've gone through advice and advice, she asks to let her go, then this has been made uh, permissible for her, you know, to ask for a khula, to ask for um, an annulment of the marriage, and he either accepts or uh, he does not. And if she feels that he's, again, being unreasonable, then there may be other uh, ways to resolve the situation by going to uh, people of knowledge to, to advise you further, okay? But, you know, it's not just the first hurdle you have in your lives that you have problems the first couple of years of your marriage. Oh, we've been married two years. Well, you're still newlyweds. You're still you're barely getting to know each other. So um, do not be afraid to, or above, you know, getting advice from family members. If they are family members who are, Munsif, that they are just and that they are fair. They can advise fairly. It's not about because it's by my family member, I will take their side. It's about standing up for what is correct, what is right. Okay, so whoever is involved in a reconciliation between uh, family members, yes, they may have the same surname as you, you may be from the same tribe, you may be from the same family, but that doesn't mean that they are upon their right and the, upon the haq, upon the truth. They could be absolutely, in, absolutely wrong. What it is upon you as an advisor is to stand for what is correct, the truth, okay? Even if it lies with the other person. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq. Allahumma ameen. How long is one allowed to stay away from one's spouse due to travel for business or education? Okay, so this sounds like a hypothetical question because you've not specified whether it's for business or education. So I just want to know. Okay, fine. Um, is there a, a specific amount of time that you are not allowed to be away from your family? Uh, there is nothing you find in the Quran specifically. There is nothing that you find in the Sunnah specifically saying that the husband is not allowed to be away from his family. No, you don't find this. The person will say that, well, during the time of the Sahaba radiallahu that Umar ibn al-Khattab commanded that the people who were in the path of giving da'wah, he would uh, tell them to come back after four months. Okay, this was his judgment, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and this is a fair judgment. This is absolute fair judgment. But because of the numbers that they had and the numbers that facilitated that kind of swapping, okay, alhamdulillah, at, at times, uh, people are not in that position. Sometimes you find, subhanAllah, a husband has to go abroad to work for one year. And he has to be away from his family due to the uh, financial situation. May Allah subhanahu wa make it easy for everybody. I mean, does that then impact their marriage? That if you are away for six months, then your nikah is no longer valid? This is, of course, nonsense. This is nonsense. This is not the case at all. Okay, and then uh, I want to dispel, you know, some of the understandings that people do have that due to maybe a person is working, education, you know, some of the examples that you gave, they've been away for two years. And then they, and somebody says, oh, you know, you've been away from your husband for two years. You better check the validity of your nikah. What are you talking about? This has no basis in Islam to say things like this, to talk about the validity of contracts, the validity of nikah in such ways. Be very, very careful. So <clears throat> there isn't any specific time, but of course, if the person is uh, away from their family, should bear in mind that being away from them you know, can, uh, has a number of negative impacts. So you try to have as much contact with them. And it again, goes back to what they both agree. Allah Ta'ala Alam. Allah Israel knows best. Um, if a man passed away, left, and his mother behind, his wife and children too, what percentage of his property will be given to his mother and wife? Well, um, well, yeah, children as well. You didn't mention them, but <laughs> nonetheless, what I would say, in inheritance issues, because there are, uh, the distribution of inheritance is not something that you and I will have any say in. This is clearly black and white in the Quran. Clearly black and white in the Quran concerning distribution. Whether the mother will receive one sixth or one third, or whether the, uh, the wife receives a quarter or an eighth, and their children and their distribution. What I would say that this platform is. Um, uh, 
this is a if you like a quick fire Q and A session, you know, and in, in such issues like inheritance, which requires probably you know somebody to sit down with you who's qualified to talk about inheritance, can take into consideration all of the relatives around that deceased. May Allah Israel have mercy upon them, and then to make it clear to you to decipher right they have a share and they don't have a share because of the presence of this one. And that they maybe uh, may receive a you know a share. So you sit with somebody who's qualified in such an issue, and then it can be explained to you, inshallah ta'ala, with the evidences and made it very clear to you so that you don't prohibit anyone from their haq, from their right. Because inheritance is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know mentioned you know in great detail in Surah An Nisa and its distribution, it was taken out of our hands. The person says, Well, I didn't see my son for two years, he didn't visit me for two years. And he doesn't get anything. It doesn't work like this. Okay, it doesn't work like this. So, inshallah ta'ala, if you go to somebody of knowledge who can de deal with this with you, for you, then that would be the best solution. And Allah Azza knows best. Okay. Um, next question. If you borrow money and many years later, the person requests the money back. But now at the current value given inflation, is that permissible for him to ask this? So 10 years ago, let's say many years ago, well, I don't know how you consider how many is 10, 15, I borrowed a thousand pounds and a thousand pounds maybe 15 years ago in its value it is not the same today. So now for, therefore it's by inflation, a thousand pounds now it's worth what? 1200 so therefore I want 1200 no not permitted for you to do that what you borrowed what was borrowed to you uh, the amount can be requested at that amount okay um, not based upon inflation so if I borrowed you a thousand pounds I will only ask you for a thousand pounds I cannot ask for any more than that and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best I know that this is uh, impacts on other issues, but to, to simplify the issue, if you borrowed money to somebody, you can only request the amount that you gave to them. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Another question is that we know that Isa alayhi salam will return towards the end of time. And we know that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam is the final prophet and messenger. Does it not go against the fact that Isa alayhi salam, Jesus will return as a prophet. So therefore Isa alayhi salam is the final prophet. We say no. The fact that the Isa alayhi salam, when he returns, he will be commanded and as he knows alayhi salam, he will implement the sharia of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. That yes, he is a prophet, but as we know, prophets alayhi salam are maybe different in their responsibilities as a rasul. A prophet will reaffirm the previous message. So yes, prophet Isa alayhi salam was a messenger and prophet when he was sent. But when he comes back, it doesn't mean that he's removed as a prophet. He's still a prophet of Allah but he will be commanded to implement the sharia of Muhammad sallallahu Therefore, there is no tanaqud, there is no contradiction between these and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Okay, brothers and sisters, we've come to the end of the show. Until we see you again, we'll see you again. Jazakumallahu khaira. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ya amanu أطيعوا الله وأطيعوا الرسول وأولي الأمر منكم فإن تنازعتم في شيء فردوه إلى الله والرسول إن كنتم تؤمنون بالله واليوم الآخر